Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Gearson. I'm director of uh, the Freeman Air and Space Institute. Thank you very much for joining us this evening in person um, and online. Um, we have focused on space quite a lot at the Freeman Institute, uh, although air power remains a big focus. But it would not be wrong to say that our most popular events online uh, during lockdown was a conversation between these two gentlemen um, that we that we ran, um, Air Marshal Godfrey and Air Marshal Smith, um, Director of Space and Director of Space Command, uh, respectively. We also had the benefit of their opinions at the launch of the Defence Space Strategy um, a few weeks ago in this very room, um, which was an interesting discussion. This is not reflective of the fact that we don't have a particularly good address book, but we thought that a number of the issues that came out of it were so interesting that we've invited uh, the, the two space leaders to come and talk about um, one year on from a number of the things that were decided, but also since their first conversation, um, where they are and where they think they might be going. Um, I'm delighted that we've got uh, Julia Baum, our uh, space research student for her PhD, um, one of our three um, funded PhDs here at the Freeman Centre, who's going to moderate, if that's a polite way of putting it, uh, and lead some of the questions. And um, David Jordan, my co-director, uh, is going to handle the online questions when we come to the Q&A. Um, we're going to operate on Chatham House Rule, I think, um, for, for this. And um, when you ask questions, if you could uh, be kind enough to identify um, who you are and where you come from. But with that, I'm going to hand over to Julia. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, just to quickly say for Q&A, for those online, uh, start getting your questions in as early as possible. Uh, we'll be doing hybrids, so both in person and online. Um, yeah, just to kind of jump right in, if that's all right. Uh, looking back at this past year, um, what are some highlights that you both have? Is there anything that stands out? Is there anything that, looking back at your year of review, is your proudest moment? I think my lowest moment was uh, being, <laughs> be, being in traffic um, five minutes after the start of this event. Uh, this evening, so I do apologize for that. You know, from my perspective, uh, I'd see Harvard's got some notes. Um, I'm, I haven't. Um, but uh, I, the highlight for me has been uh, just being a part of this, actually. You know, having spent 30 years in the, uh, you know, in the aerospace side and the flying side, I never thought I'd, uh, I'd be coming into the space. Never thought I'd be, uh, I know all of you have heard this before, but it has been enormously um, useful, brilliant, working with Harv, you know, we joined the Air Force together. Um, and I think that's some of how we've managed to get so far in, the, in, the, uh, in, in this particular year. Um, so being a part of it, starting an organization from scratch, um, that, I mean, that is kind of a once in a lifetime event. Um, you know, not many people get to do that. It's a lot harder than you think it's gonna be when you pitch up on day one and go, oh, this'll be easy, and you open the can of worms and they, uh, they all disappear everywhere. But just, you know, as I look around the audience here, there's so many familiar faces. We've just done our first um, industry day, essentially, our uh, space seminar for Space Command. Um, I really feel like we had a connection with so many people in the audience there that were essentially all new to me a year ago. So being a part of it, starting a new organization, um, and meeting a bunch of unbelievably interesting people in a domain that is essentially new when it comes to uh, you know, the operational side of things. The whole thing has been brilliant. So the entire year has been a highlight. What he said. <laughs> I think I, so. Obviously, I've, I've got about a year head start on Goddard's because we stood the directorate up a couple of years ago. I think uh, this year, what's been good to see uh, through the lens of the directorate in head office has been it all kind of coming together. So you know, the money came together. The, we got the defence space program settled as to what that would look like. We got, um, you know, Goddard's came in and took on Space Command. Space Command stood up and started taking on the work. And um, so it's just, I think the biggest thing this last year has been just seeing it come together. And probably the, the pinnacle of that was when we were last in here, getting the space strategy issued. And there were, people have heard me say before, there were quite a few naysayers about just our ability to get the space strategy published. Um, you know, it's been tried before, I've been at this for 10 years, 
oh, there's better than you have tried this type of banter. And actually, it was, it, it was hard at work at the end just to get it over the line. Um, but I think that has set, and we talked about this earlier today with industry, what that has allowed us now is uh, something that we can hook a golden thread to, and that's really important, particularly for Space Command as they go forward here and take on more of the heavy lifting of capability uh, delivery. Because we didn't have that before. We didn't have an ability to go in front of an investment appraisals council and say, here's the programme, here's my pitch, here's how much money I need, and here's the golden thread that goes all the way back up to a defence space strategy, which hooks into a national space strategy, which is signed at the top of government, and that's why you need to give me the money. We didn't have that before, so it was at, uh, at worst could have been accused of you know, people just wanting to get after pet projects. So it's been nice to be able to settle that and now have clear aim points. Um, the trick now in this next year is to start implementing. It, it is worth saying as well, I've mentioned the um, defence space strategy, you know, so you've got sort of one thing there. Actually, in two days time, we declare our initial operating capability. So, uh, you know, I think that becomes our thing. Um, and, you know, I mentioned the, the sort of can of worms and how difficult it is. We started, many of you, I think, have heard me say, we started with six people on the 31st of March last year. 1st of April, suddenly with Farningdale's and with uh, um, uh, some of our units up at Waddington and, uh, and down at High Wycombe, we ended up with 400 people, all looking at us, wondering which way we're going, you know, and doing the Wallace and Gromit, laying the track in front of the train as we steam around the living room. But we've got to a point here with IOC that is essentially we've got a bunch of track laid out now. Um, you know, we know where we're going. Um, and we've grown the command and, uh, you know, I talk about the people in this room, there are uh, a couple of people in this room who've uh, been important to, uh, you know, how we've grown and the fact that we're reaching IOC. And it, it is just, a, 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 you know, all credit to the personnel within the command and the directorate that we work closely with, that we've managed to get to this point and we've managed to declare IOC. We possibly talk about the, the bits we haven't got to as part of IOC. Um, but, uh, you know, to be able to do that in what is, feels like 10 minutes, but is actually a year, um, I think has been fantastic. Yeah, thinking about those difficulties that you're mentioning, uh, when you first started in the first few days or, or months, was there anything unexpected that, you know, presented as a hurdle in the first uh, steps? Well, certainly from my perspective, because Harv and the team had been there, they'd actually cleared a bunch of those hurdles out of the way. And the fact that defence um, had fully embraced the um, uh, a space command just made it so much easier for us. I think that the, probably the biggest hurdle for me um, and the command as we've gone through the years, and not necessarily at the beginning, has been this, doesn't sound like a, a hurdle, but the slow growth of our workforce um, across the way. So yeah. we're, we're lower than we wanted to be right now, which has actually manifested itself in we haven't been able to take on all of the capability programs that we've wanted to from the Space Directorate. Um, uh, and that is, you know, we've been working this through. There are a number of reasons why this happened, but we're starting to accelerate now. We're, we're, we're getting into it, we're growing the team, but it has meant that the team that we've got have been working really hard in order to try and fill those gaps. And, and, and actually we brought on some, uh, some, just a small amount of contractor support to fill those gaps at the moment while we, uh, while we build that military and civil service um, uh, workforce as well. So that's probably been the biggest hurdle and the biggest one to manage, um, and, but that's really only come in in the sort of last sort of four to six months, uh, I think. I think I would I'd absolutely agree with that. That's been harder than we expected. Historically doing workforce growth always is, um, but it's generally getting the money and getting the positions agreed. We call them the J-PANs. You know, the, the kind of the admin function of a seat for someone to sit on. Actually, what we've found here is it's been quite hard to find the humans to get just to get the humans in because we've not we've not necessarily grown any of the three services to allow Space Command to grow. So we're going and taking those people. We've got to stop something to do this. So that can be a challenge. Um, but as God has said, they're they're kind of on a good path through this year. Um, and what's been nice with the relationship between the directorate and the command 
is we've been able to t easily take that decision, say, okay, well, we'll delay that a bit and we'll keep running that here. You take this on. You know, we've lent a couple of people out of the directorate into the command to just keep some progress going. I think for me, one of the things that's been the biggest surprise in terms of challenge has been maintaining the narrative, maintaining the support for the narrative of space and just having to constantly go back and justify why this is important. Um, and that, that has surprised me. I thought you would only have to say that one or two times and people are like, right, we get it now, we're good. But we are, particularly in the directorate and within the head office where there's always a fight for the money, there's always a positioning for prioritization when there's only one bucket of cash. And we, do, we are finding that we have to consistently go and justify what, you know, we gave you this amount of money at the IR, you, you need to come again and re-explain what you're doing with that and why that's right for defence. So this is why we talk about, both of us you'll hear us talk about this next few years, three to four years, really important that we use that money constructively to deliver tangible products that actually does change things for defence, where people, where people can say, well, because we've got this thing now in space, these things are now easier for us, or it has opened these doors that weren't previously open. Um, so that when we go in front of Treasury, et cetera, at the next spending review in a few years' time, it's more than fancy PowerPoint. You know, we actually have product to say, last time you gave us this, we presented this plan, we've done, we stood up a space command, the team have taken it on, we've delivered these products, and actually, uh, you know, we've underpinned some MDI, we've done operational capability, life is getting better, we're inc increasing our operational advantage, um, et cetera, et cetera. That's really important, this idea of having a license to operate. If we want to keep that, um, I think the next couple of years are critical in terms of implementing and delivery. I, I have just thought of a single hurdle, and that's the, there's only 24 hours in the day. Um, but, you know, the, uh, clearly, I'm not serious, I'm serious uh, on that particular front, but one of the hardest things has actually been uh, engagement. Um, so it, I think it was your point that just, uh, just made that come to mind, Harv, where, you know, right from the beginning, because we wanted to be, you know, the two things I always say about the command, joint and collaborative, because we wanted to be collaborative. It, today we had, I don't know how many it was, uh, 150 um, industry representatives in the room. I'm kind of glad to say that I've probably had conversations with every single one of them, you know, at some on multiple occasions. Um, and so in order to try and do that, and engage with everyone right from the beginning and tell them what we're about and tell them where we're going, as well as putting the command together and, as I say, laying the track around the living room um, in order that we got uh, somewhere to go and, and bring the people together. We, we really have been limited by, um, you know, how much time we've had, um, and that has been hard work. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's something we want to continue, and, and I think we've got the relationships now. I'm looking around the room for uh, to see if there's any nods. Um, in here, I think we've got the relationships now set where we can just continue to, those discussions, and it's not as difficult as it is right at the beginning when you're trying to build that initial relationship. But it goes to that point about continually talking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, yep. and, and where we're going. Well, we're excited a wee bit doom and gloom, aren't we? I see it's been really successful, you know, and I, I'd be happy to challenge, you know, all the parts of defence and say, show me somewhere else that has, you know, had equal success to what we've had in terms of just getting this thing up and running from what was a relatively greenfield site. And we have a strategy, which is hooked to a national strategy. Importantly, we've got governance, really good governance that's now proven across government all the way to a prime minister. We've got a command stood up. When was the last time that happens? Um, and actually, we're delivering. You know, Minerva's off and running as our first programme. That transfers across to Goddard in the next couple of days. And that's actually, you know, we're often delivering in a contract with that already. So, you know, it's not all, there's, there, obviously there's bits of it that are hard. It is complex. Um, but I think all told we've made good progress with it. Yeah, I think despite those hurdles, yeah. we've got a national, uh, the national and defence space strategy. Yeah. And we get into IOC, but we just can't rest here. No. Need more time again. So I suppose on a more optimistic note, 
Um, you mentioned personal relationships as something that's quite strong in the space industry, but also industry military relations. Um, considering you both grew up through the RAF together, would you say that your uh, personal relationship or your uh, close working relationship is part of directorate and command success? And then I guess on the flip side of that, is that a challenge for defense thinking of uh, building the next defense leaders and how the personal element feeds into that? Yeah, I, I think it is. We might start arguing like an old married couple here in a minute. <laughs> but uh, no, it definitely is. I mean, you know, again, we did, you know, we joined the Royal Air Force together on the same day, flown the same airplanes, been on squadrons together. That definitely helps. Um, also, you know, we we go to the rugby and whilst you're watching Ireland beat England, we can talk about <laughs> how, um, how we're going to solve the next challenge. So yeah, that, that it does it does help. There's no doubt about it. And the last thing you would want is, you know, to be a competitive nature. We we talked about this when Goddard's got told he got the job, and that was our first conversation. This is, this isn't going to be a competition. This is going to be you know, greater than the sum of the parts. That's what we're going to get after here. And I think we've we've been doing that. Um, and we and because we're good pals, we're able to have tough conversations about stuff. Um, that doesn't always happen. That's just humans. You know, it's, that's hard. I think what's key is with all of these things, you can't rely on personal relationships. And in my experience, great if you have them, you kind of make hay whilst the sun shines. But you've got to put the processes in place for when you get a couple of people that maybe don't get on. And that does happen. But the processes and the governance keep it clean and everybody knows what their roles are. Um, and I think we've done that. I think we've got a good, solid governance process. It'll continue to be tested and adjusted, particularly as Space Command takes on more of the capability work. Um, but I'm very confident that either the two of us could walk away and we could get a couple of ANSI people in here and it would still work because the process is there to underpin it. I think it, you know, it's been strange on occasion because I know it's sometimes difficult when you know you became Mr. Space in the uh, in the MOD. I don't think that, that's not his nickname, uh, by the way. But uh, it's much better than that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, then when another two star came along, and the fact that we and you know the fact that we're wearing the same uniform, but we go to the same events. I think has and could cause confusion in various areas, which is why we spend so much time talking about it. One of the yeah. slides I put up today for the industry forum was a Venn diagram that, that showed where the grey shaded area in the middle is that's quite <coughs> thick at the moment mm -hmm. in terms of, of what we do together and how this is going to drift apart in the, uh, in the future as, as we get our feet, as we have now with IOC underneath us, we've got the governance in place and so on. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, we're always kind of smiling and, and talking, uh, a lot of talking uh, to, uh, together. And, you know, I don't know whether some other areas of defense look on and go, well, they seem to be having a laugh. That, you know, that can't work. Uh, how's that working? But I think that, not I think, that comes down to the personal relationship. But, as you said, we have managed to have the hard conversations, and I think having that good personal relationship sometimes makes that difficult, yeah. is that you don't want to annoy your friend, but on a professional basis, you have to have the difficult conversations. Yeah. That, you know, the other, when we were talking about loaning personnel from one way to the other, you know, half has to tell me no in certain areas, when, can I just borrow them for six weeks? No, we're doing this, oh, damn it, okay. You know, we're not afraid of having those conversations with each other. Um, and, uh, you, you know, if whenever either of us move on, I think it'll be a real shame because, you know, this is, as I say, coming back to the point of, as you have done, you know, forming an organization from scratch is a kind of high point in your life. Um, and to do it with someone that you've worked with for so long and trust um, has just made it so much easier yeah. uh, along the way. So, you know, I don't know whether that's a model you can bring in defense, you know, you, you've got to fight. This was kind of accidental. We're going to be posted together. Now forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll go everywhere as a two yeah. um, But it has made it so much easier, genuinely, that we can WhatsApp, text, have a conversation, and solve problems even before they become problems. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully the, from the staff and the directorate to 
the team in space command, you know, they don't feel that friction and know that they can, uh, you know, uh, that we are solving problems for them before, before we actually get to them. To sort of uh, change gears and look into the future a bit, uh, you've already spoken a bit about short-term goals. Looking into the long term, whether it's 10, 20 plus years, or if you're willing to be zealous, you could talk about the year 3000. Um, where do you see sort of the priorities or the focus for commanded director at success mm. or, or sort of the future of it? Yeah, I'm going to go to my strategy guy on that one. It's, uh, I'd, so this is why I love this job so much, um, because of, you can have conversations like we're just about to have, I hope, <laughs> where, you know, you can, you, it's, we, I tried to get this going a wee bit today at the industry engagement. I've kind of built this PowerPoint slide, you know, the last two years, the next 20. Um, and if we look at what we expect to happen in the next 20 in the space domain, it is quite amazing. Even if only 50% of it's delivered, it's still going to be quite amazing. Humans back on the moon, more you know, permanent basing on the moon, a, a lunar gateway, perhaps um, you know, mineral extraction from asteroids, certainly from the moon. What's that mean for Earth? What's that mean for, what's the next gen or generation after next prosperity agenda going to look like if we've cracked the nut that is mineral mining off of an asteroid? Um, and then that broader bit about going to Mars. Someone asked a question recently, once humans go to Mars, when a, ba when a baby's born there, is it a human or is it a Martian? Where would you ever get to have that conversation in any other job in defence? So it is, it is uh, really interesting and intriguing and you can, it's almost, starts to get into science fiction and we've had this discussion around how science fiction actually some of it has now come true um, and maybe some of those people that write science fiction are the sorts of people you want in your strategy teams looking 20 30 years out um, but it, i think the big question in all seriousness for defense is what's our role in that mindful that the whole purpose of defense is supposed to be protect and defend the nation and the, you know, the national interests. Well, if our national interests properly extend to space in terms of economic prosperity, let's say a space-based solar power, and we have to defend that from a defense perspective, what's that look like? And then this broader question around if, you know, SpaceX, et cetera, keep doing what they're doing. And, you know, effectively anyone can access space because it's relatively economically viable. At some point, some, some bad people are going to get into space and there's going to be some sort of space terrorism type thing. What's that look like? How do we respond to it? What's the role of defense in that? You know, we saw how a big strategic impact, big strategic shock like 9-11 affected the whole of Earth. What would something like that in space look like for us? How would we respond to that? What's the role of defense? So that's a discussion, you know, for SDSR 25 or SDSR 30, but it's a discussion that needs to start finding its feet today, I think, so that folk in this room, particularly from the world of academia, can maybe start putting a little bit of rigor behind the thinking so that it isn't just science fiction. But I, that discussion for me is really interesting. What does that look like in the future? What would our equipment pro program look like 20 years from now if we're told you've got to protect the space line of communication? That could be very exciting. Back to X-Wings. X-Wing fighters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, from my perspective on that, uh, you know, having said about the Wallace and Gromit train, um, <coughs> I haven't laid that much track in front of the train yet, uh, you know, in order to, uh, to determine where we're going. We, it's one of the things we talked about today, you know, in the last five weeks, I think there's been a profound change um, and we can't predict where we're going. So whatever we do, I think there's a need to um, just be flexible in terms of, of where we're going. And again, without repeating with the, some of the same audience here, but uh, the reason we originally had a full operating capabilities, so we're hitting initial operating capability in a couple of days. There was originally, as there always is in the military plan, a, a full operating capability or a final operating capability. I deliberately got rid of that because I didn't want there to be a final shape, size, whatever of the command. Um, and, you know, I'd always enjoyed the phrase, iPhone doesn't have an FOC. And so I think there's an organic growth 
that if we get the right structures in place will allow us to, to move with whatever happens, with whatever shocks come along. Um, I also mentioned today our, our, uh, our vision in terms of making um, space safe, secure and sustainable for all generations. That points to that long term. You know, the sustainability aspect is key. Mm -hmm. And so definitely in the next few years when we're looking at debris, the companies out there that are doing debris removal, um, space traffic control, all of those elements I think come together to ensure that space is sustainable and accessible to future generations. Because if we get this wrong right now, then there won't be a future space because we won't be able to get into it yeah. uh, for a start. Um, and so I think a couple of those aspects, that agility to be able to change to whatever the, uh, the strategic context is changing to, um, and just that maintaining sustainability and having that longer look and not just being, um, I think, blinkered by capabilities now that might have an effect into the future. I think we need to consider sustainability. Um, as we do everything from both the defense, and that's why it's really good to be working closely with our um, space agency and Bay space directorate colleagues um, that were actually on stage with us uh, at the last event here um, to ensure that we're doing this collectively from a UK perspective and engaging with all the other nations out there as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess it's those two points that the things that I think about for the future rather than, or, or, as well as X-Wings. Uh, you know, just, just to kind of close on it, but a couple of things Goddard said sparked with me. The, this idea of, um, and this is me now with my kind of co-chair of National Space Board hat on, where we're looking for opportunities for UK to maybe leapfrog ahead to be a global leader in certain parts of space. And we, you know, we're not naive enough to think we'll ever be able to match the likes of the USA or, or China uh, in terms of you know how much money we put into it, so this idea of you know how let's measure success in how many satellites we've got is that's the wrong place to start. But there are definite there's definite opportunity for us to lead the world in things like uh, licensing and legislation, and the work that FCDO is leading into the UN. We're supporting very closely on space norms and what could that look like? God has mentioned space traffic management. You know, 100 years ago, you know, if you would have stood where Heathrow is today and looked up, you wouldn't have ever have thought there would be a Heathrow and you know, airplanes landing with 250 people in them every X number of seconds in the fog. Um, but we got there because we put legislation and we put ICAO rules. And um, I think there's opportunity for UK to lead in that discussion. It doesn't cost much money. It's about thought leadership. It's about having the putting the intellect into it and then influence and doing that role that UK does well, this idea of being the honest broker and being an interlocutor across the world. And we're seeing that play out really well in the UN with the FCDO work. The other thing is, where are the opportunities in terms of spin-off from space? And one of the things that we're just starting to look at, and this is me more and I as a light blue officer, I more than doing the space stuff, but if indeed SpaceX get something like a Starship working properly and we end up with this rocket that can lift 120 tons and go to Mars. It can also lift 120 tons and get anywhere point to point on Earth in less than 50 minutes. What's that mean for generation after next C-17? Maybe we shouldn't be thinking about Bryce Norton flying airplanes, but in 2050, maybe they should be flying Starships and sending cargo around the world that way, or people. What's, what's that look like? And again, there's a conversation to be had now, because that, in terms of a concept and in terms of trial, is going to happen within the next five years. Guaranteed. That's certainly where we see that company going. And we're starting to work at looking at options for how, how could we be involved with that discussion to learn the lessons and see, is there a viability in something like that? And there'll be plenty other spin-offs. <laughs> Um, that we can then apply to the other domains to make us even better. And I think that's the role that the Space Directorate, certainly as we make this transition with Space Command taking on you know, the day-to-day -day hard grind of delivering space for defence, the, the Space Directorate's role of doing more of the up and out and the horizon scanning for where's the opportunity in the future, seeding the narrative for future defence reviews and 
you know, maybe doing a few studies, early studies on it, to really look at being a global leader in certain areas. And I think that's really exciting as well, that part of it. Yeah, thank you for those. Those are very interesting. And I look forward to meeting you on the moon someday. Good, yeah. <laughs> um, so I won't steal any more of your time, and I think it's important to open the floor for Q&A. Um, we'll be taking questions online, so just a reminder to submit your questions online. And when the, there are two roving mics, um, when you've been selected, just introduce yourself with your name and where you're from. So the first question will go to Richard Franklin. Good evening. Thank you. Um, firstly, congratulations for surviving the first year. <laughs> I'm two days away from IOC and 150 industry players. I'm sure that's been the worst bit. Um, other nations are seeing the threat in space and accelerating capability. Partly Ukraine recently, we've seen Germany saying, how fast can they replace stuff? You were in Australia. The Australians are really worried, the Pacific threat, Asia. Would you like to accelerate? And if so, You've mentioned there are only 24 hours in a day. We see the challenge, 150 of us trying to get to you. Um, what could we as industry do to help you accelerate? And in particular, what sort of models to embrace the SMEs that you talk to, to get to those fast capabilities that you want in a sustainable way? So I'll kick off with the first part of that. Um, what was interesting, so I have just come back from Australia, so if I pass out at the back of the stage, it's because I still haven't adjusted to the time zone yet. But um, it was interesting seeing the, the launch of the uh, Australian Defence Space Command. It was really interesting talking to my um, German colleague, uh, the two-star space commander. We've got a really good relationship amongst all of the space commanders in the, uh, in the CSPO, the Combined Space Operations Forum. Um, and so unsurprisingly, the conversation went to 100 billion euros. What are you going to do with it? Um, Mike was particularly pleased that, you know, where they'd had uh, ambiguity in funding for their space program, they haven't got ambiguity now. We talked about whether they had the mechanisms to be able to cope procurement mechanisms, financial mechanisms, um, the ability to speak to industry, given how much of industry is, is now heading towards Germany. Um, and uh, you know, and looking to help them with the uh, with the spend, um, and that was an interesting conversation. So when you, so yeah, wouldn't it be brilliant to have more money? Wouldn't it be brilliant to be able to do additional stuff? Um, I've said to the team, you know, we had to crawl before we can walk, before we can run, and as we reach IOC, that's essentially the point that we've gone from a crawl into a walk. I would not try and sprint now. So when you talk about accelerating. I would just like to get the structures in place, get the relationships in, in, in place. As Harv has mentioned already, start delivering, I think, get the quick wins out the way with Minerva, you know, everything that we're going to do in the next year or so before we even consider expanding after that. Um, you know, I go back to the, the can of worms point, you know, at the beginning with all the worms crawling. We just brigaded them back into a, a sort of straight line. And I think if we tried to do something too quickly right now, then we'd probably break it. And, uh, across whether it's Australia or Canada, France, um, you know, are, are ahead of us in terms of uh, standing up their space command and what they've managed to do and the fact they've got heavy lift with Ariane, you know, all of these different things with France. But, um, you know, when I look across most of the other nations, um, it's almost exactly the same ambition as us. And actually, it's broader than defence as well. Certainly with Australia, it's about, as we are here, enhancing the the um, space enterprise across the United Kingdom, it's exactly the same in Australia. And it's the same in Germany as well. Um, so yeah, it'd be brilliant to just inject money into it and make it happen. But as I said, you know, one of the challenges I wasn't expecting was increasing the workforce. I couldn't magic people out of the air. It, it, you know, we could bring contractors in if you gave me all the money in the world. But it is about putting the structures in place, I think, Richard, on that particular front. Um, so. Uh the question about threats well placed, because there is one, and we shouldn't shy away from that. And we even see our US colleagues being much more overt in the public domain about where they see the threat. I heard a great quote the other day that Russia is the imminent threat, China is the pacing threat, 
and climate change is the shaping threat. And if that, if we stand by that as a as a position, then you know we 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 kind of go back and look at well what was our analysis that underpinned where we've ended up with a defence space program, um, and the shape of that going forward. And I actually I think we're in about the right place. We're in about the right place with the amount of budget we had. Anybody can write an incredibly ambitious plan, but at some point you've got to close with the resource. Um, and actually, we did have an incredibly ambitious plan at the start of the IR process, and then you go through that financial knife fight, um, which you know, at one point we were concerned we might lose it all. Um, and actually, where we ended up was a, was an okay place to be, mindful of how bad it could have been. Um, so you know, we were we were very happy with that, and we've got enough to be able to put a foundation in. What's interesting is we have, when we saw Russia, or the Ukraine crisis bubble up, one of the things that we have been doing is just a little bit of financial contingency planning, just in case, um, just within the department. Um, and certainly from our perspective, what that meant was a, let's have a look at just dusting off what the original proposal was for the IR. Um, and if we, you know, if we were asked, what could you do if you got more money quickly? There is at least a plan there that isn't a back of a fag packet, last minute. Oh, we'd buy some of these things. That was a, that was uh, underpinned by you know five years worth of analysis. We just ended up having to pare it back and change the shape of the profile. So there is a plan there that is a let's call it oven ready. There's a plan there that's oven ready. Um, so I think that we would have confidence, but Goddess's point's right. There's more to capability than just buying kit. Um, you know, the whole tepid oil thing. And sometimes, as I have accused others in the past of uh, tepid oil with a capital E, it's all about the equipment. And actually, you know, we, we can't lose sight of the personnel, the training, the infrastructure to support, um, all of which takes time to pull through, particularly on the people and building experience. I do, however, think that one of the lessons we're seeing out of Ukraine is leveraging into the commercial markets and how you can quickly, with money, leverage into the commercial markets. Um, and we talked a little bit about this today. You know, it seems to me that every every sat image I see on the news at the moment's got a Maxar stamp on it, um, and they're pretty pretty high fidelity images. Um, so there's definitely something we could do quickly there. If the, if the question was, we want you to accelerate, here's a bunch of new money, what would you do with it immediately? It would probably be that. Um, and we would have to look at some sensible partnership with industry to help us get there in terms of making best use of it. And um, I think we've got the wherewithal within DI and the likes to process it for sure. Um, but you know, we, you've, you've heard us, Richard, talk about future collaborations that are more than the old school customer supplier relationship. So that would need to be looking at what could the partnership be where we're all in it together delivering this uh, on behalf of the nation. I think we did accelerate some stuff with Airbus recently. I've yeah. mentioned it at the, the conference today with um, you know everything we put in place with Artemis and be able to get Vision 1 imagery uh, across to the National Centre for Geospatial Intelligence. Um, and through some good work from your team, Richard, the um, unlocking some tasking in uh, Novasar, you know, exactly to Harv's point yep. of, uh, you know, some good partnerships there um, in order to get what was required to the right people. So there was a little bit of acceleration on, on that particular front. That was both sides as well. It was, you know, it wasn't just us. Um, and, but uh, I think, you know, that was a good example of the sort of teaming that could come together. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the US are doing this as well. You know, it's not... It's not we would do it because we didn't have the wherewithal to do it any other way. This seems to be, in practice, the best way to get after it. So, you know, and it plays to this idea of what we've talked about, the uncollaborated access and what's that look like. And as we go through this summer through the National Space Board, we're looking at properly unpicking that. What would that mean to really help industry? What does own mean? You know, what does sovereign mean? Um, and there's a bit of work to still to go on that just so that industry can properly understand it and know how they would then react to that. Um, but certainly the model of partnering in a 
in a meaningfully collaborative way with industry to exploit commercial uh, capability. We're seeing that play out today, and it seems to be pretty damn good. Great. Are there any other questions in the audience? Uh, Simon Henley from uh, Reaction Engines. Um, I will say this from Reaction Engines point of view, uh, C17 after next, or to be sensitive to our sponsors, A400 after next. Um, I hope it's horizontal launch and recovery, not, not vertical. Um, the question actually is, we're, the first year of uh, Space Command uh, and where we are, we're still to some extent in a bit of a honeymoon period, albeit that things in Ukraine are making it a lot more serious than it would otherwise have been. These things only really become serious. Part of the defense space strategy is, is based around collaboration to get assured access to things like launch, uh, where they're too expensive to be borne by one individual country. Things start to get very serious and relationships change when you start entering into programs where you are mutually dependent for assured access on something that's joint. The UK of late has been, on the civil side, space side, you know, the, the previous partner of choice has been ESA, but there's a degree of ambivalence at government level, certainly on the civil side towards ESA. You've mentioned a number of partners that you're talking to who are new players in the game. When do we think we'll start to see some bets being placed as to who are your strategic partners to do these things? And I'm probably asking too much speculators to who some of those first partners might be. Shall I have a go? Yeah, come on. So it's, it's a live topic at the Space Board, um, and we'll work it through this summer. I, I, I wouldn't want to kind of jump into detail now because there's a ton of analysis to go, and frankly, whatever the analysis said, then it will be uh, influenced by a healthy smear of politics, um, and we, we all know that. What's, what's interesting for me is just the way things have worked out. On the military side, we tend to look west. We tend to be quite Atlanticist, and it's all about our US colleagues. And you know, it probably was not lost on no one in our defense space strategy that the only nation we mentioned by name was the USA. But that's a space relationship that's existed for many, many decades. And we've benefited from that in terms of a receipt of space-derived data that we've then been part of the processing and the analysis. Um, what we're trying to do now is just put a bit more skin in the game to kind of earn it a bit more, to be honest. So that relationship will and uh, is and will remain really important to us and have some semblance of primacy for sure, in my view. Um, in the broader discussion of the cross-government and ESA, um, uh, you know, I kind of talk about this at risk of getting way outside my own swim lane and being told off. Um, so I would just say you know, we're doing we're doing a ton of work on ESA, on ESA, particularly with the Council of Ministers coming up this autumn, this November. I we're we're looking at some specific programmes like Copernicus. We're uh, still trying to work out where do we go now that we've left Galileo. Um, what would that all mean in terms of, you know, if you were being particularly bold and you said, well, maybe we're not going to commit just as much to an organization like ESA because we're not seeing as much in terms of uh, contracts coming back to UK because of the ramifications of Brexit. Uh, well, then what would a good divide look like? I don't think anybody's saying we should get out of ESA. That it's about what, where do we put our efforts into that organization in terms of maintaining the relationship in a meaningful way, uh, but getting after the things that, that we know are right for us. And if that frees up some cash, then how would we use that in, back in UK for some semblance of national programmes that then the broader UK space sector could really get behind? <coughs> and then, then you might be able to have conversations around, should we, could we have a national EO programme? What would that look like? We've already been quite overt. We're putting the guts of a billion pounds into an ISR program. Um, you know, what if there was some money on the civil side that could at least maybe even match fund that? That's not a bad place to be, especially if uh, 
the Minister for Science, is correct in his assumption that when HMG puts a pound into space, the sector should match it with three. So if I did the math on that, that would be a £5 billion programme over 10 years. That seems OK for a big EO programme, and I'm sure we could do a hell of a lot more than what we've seen historically as technology has come on. So those conversations are all live, no decisions yet. All will go up through the Space Council, all will be politically influenced, and it's incredibly difficult to predict how that, would, how that discussion would go. And what's good is that we're closing with the discussion, and it's at the ministerial level. And my experience thus far is that the ministers are being incredibly open-minded about it. <coughs> Um, and they're willing to, to you know, show me the data, show me the metrics, show me the analysis, and we'll let, that, we'll let that lead a conversation, and then we'll put the political nuance on the top of that. So, you know, as a good government official, my job is to produce the analysis and the data and present options, um, and then we'll see where the likes of the National Space Council takes it. Hopefully that's... It's as good as you're going to get, Simon. <laughs> Certainly, from a you know from the command perspective, um, the CSPO, the Command Space Operations uh, Forum, is the prime forum along with NATO. You know, NATO is you know, declared space as an operational domain in, in 2018, and actually is in the same position as us in sort of building an emerging um, uh, space centre. Uh, actually, down at Ramstein, France. Uh, looking at building the uh, NATO Centre of Excellence. So we've already got a really good core there in terms of collaboration. As I mentioned with Richard's question, the, there's a really interesting discussion to be had with Germany as a, uh, as a close neighbour. Harv went out to France uh, just recently uh, for their Asterix exercise, and, the, and I think it was really impressive from everything that I've heard with, the, with what they were doing there. Um, from a previous life as a station commander up at Lossy Mouth, uh, being in the F-35 program, we talked a lot with the Scandinavian uh, uh, countries. That's not a conversation that we've realistically started you know, from a space perspective. We've had these conversations, especially when you bring in companies like OneWeb or whoever who, uh, you know, now from a, a broadband, a SATCOM perspective, can, uh, you know, can start doing things in the high north. Um, We've had conversations with Japan. We've had conversations with uh, um, with Korea. Um, there's a bunch of different people out there that are doing some brilliant things. Again, and for us, it comes back down to resource at the end of the day, and how, as I've mentioned about the you know not having enough hours in the day, um, we have to come back and prioritise the sort of key relationships, which leads us back to CSPO um, and and back to NATO, and just ensuring that we you know we do our very best as a good partner in those organizations and try and, and do as much as we can to sort of share the load and, and actually get somewhere as well. Um, one of the blockers in that, you talked about hurdles, is classification uh, of, uh, of ultimately military space, which I think is something we really do need to, to look at when it comes to dual use. Um, and the final point I'll make is that um, whichever way we go, uh, you know, from the ESA side, from the space agency, the good thing is, with the four of us, with Harv, Rebecca, myself, and Paul, we do a hell of a lot of talking right now. You know, Paul uh, is in the middle of the transformation of the UK Space Agency into more of a delivery organisation than where they had been before in terms of managing grants and that, that sort of direct line into ESA. Um, but whatever we do, I think we've got kind of got all bases covered here from looking that way. The, prime sort of defence relationship looking across the Atlantic. Um, but uh, uh, again, it's down to resource and, and we're prioritising right now. Just being mindful of those online, are there any questions from <coughs> Jordan? Yeah, there are a few. Um, uh, anonymous attendee has been very diligent in asking questions. Um, <laughs> but I'll go, uh, if you'll forgive me, with sort of named individuals first. Um, Harsh Sater um, says that space budgets and priorities, um, referring to states, have often increased and decreased with the arrival of new presidents in the United States of America. 
Um, and wonders what, in your opinion, the biggest risk to your objectives and vision for uh, UK space is. And there's a related um, question from Marcus Burton about budget as well, which I'll tie in, if I may, uh, where he says the budget allocated to space command is comparatively, he thinks, very small compared to those in private sector, sp private sector space companies. Uh, and how will space command keep parity with the speed of private sector space and still meet the aspirations? I'll start. So the budget thing, I did notice yesterday, actually, uh, we mentioned this earlier, 24 and a half billion um, annual budget for uh, US Space Force. Um, I mean, that's eye-watering. You know, it's back to your point, Richard, in, in terms of, uh, of could you accelerate if they gave you uh, all, of that, uh, all of that cash? And I think, you know, ultimately, our, what we have to do and what we are trying to do is add value to the United States in terms of probably the pacing threat, you know, when it comes to it, uh, as, uh, as you talked about earlier. I mentioned it today, I'll mention it in a bunch of different forums, you know, where we take our, what is a comparatively tiny little cog and try and fit it into the enormous US machine is difficult. You know, where do we put it? Where do we invest our money? Where do we take our budget that we've been given? And I, I, the value of having had the space directorate look at this and determine essentially the pipelines and where the money fits is because they've done that analysis. Um, and the more difficult bit, going back to the relationship side of things, is you've got a bunch of different cogs from a bunch of different nations. How do they all fit together into that big machine? And how do we make sure that our gears aren't crunching when we put them in together? You know, how does that collaboration work? We talked about Australia and the, uh, and the other various nations earlier. Um, so, it's about taking what we've got and using it intelligently, I think, um, on, that, on that side of things. So, you know, you can get lost in budgets. I did a, an exchange tour with the United States Air Force uh, over 9-11, actually. And um, we were in Iraq at the time when it happened, came back from uh, and were flying combat air patrols over the top of Washington, D.C. At that particular time, there were combat air patrols across every major conurbation in the uh, continental United States, and they'd already sent assets across to uh, Afghanistan, and it was eye-watering the scale of it. And the, there's an element of depression you go through when you come back from that and going, well, I'm back to a, an Air Force of, I think it was probably about 45,000 at the time. What's the point? But then you soon realize where you fit into the broader scheme and how you can be a good ally and partner. And I think having done that, Coming into the space side of things, I wasn't too depressed to see 24 and a half billion as an annual budget. Oh, and by the way, that doesn't include some of the other intelligence community out there. Um, I think it's just a matter of perspective and coming back to earlier points, not trying to run before we're uh, before we're walking properly. Um, and so, you know, the big conversation right now is is how do we best target the money we've got? It's a lot of money. If you take this, tell someone in the street you've got five and a half billion for satellite communications over the next 10 years and a billion and a half for a defense space portfolio. That is a lot of money. So we've just got to make sure that we make every pound count. I don't know that I have much more to add. Um, you know, budgets are budgets. They'll always be hard. And we just have to, it, in many ways, it links back to the point I made earlier about constantly being on the narrative and uh, making sure that people are supportive and understanding of why it's important to spend the money in that area when everybody else is trying to innovate and do new things and develop new kit and bring new capability to bear, all of which is required in this more competitive sub-threshold world. Um, you know, why should we have a billion and a half more of new money? I'm sure if there was a cyber person here, they'd be saying, well, I could spend that. You know, it's equally as challenging in the cyber world. So. Um, you've got to cut your cloth some way. We've, we've landed where we are. I think the point is to get the foundation right and then to leverage the partnerships that we've got. You know, and there's a huge appetite from particularly the USA to partner. They see, you know, and again, have spoken publicly around the pacing threat being China and the best deterrence for that as a pacing threat is a global partnership of like-minded spacefaring nations, all of whom are working together through this lens of safe, secure, and sustainable space. 
Um, and being part of that then gives us access to the 24 billion budget that they're about to spend in certain areas, like we've enjoyed for many decades. Um, so it's it's a tricky question to just neck down on, particularly on budget, because it's it's all interlaced. Just being mindful of time, I think we should just take two more questions together from the audience. If there are any, uh, one over here, and then we'll take. Over here. Hi, um, Katie King from University of Cambridge. So I want to go back to your point about the workforce. I found it quite interesting that you said that that's been like a rate determining step, as it were, because I mean, everyone in this room is interested in space and wants to see UK space thrive. So I'm interested in knowing what specialisations you're looking for in your workforce and how you think or are planning to accommodate that or bring those people in, rather than maybe just nabbing people from Harv's team. Um, so yeah, I wonder what the plan is. And the other question? Uh, yeah, uh, Neil Deal with Taz UK. Um, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you awake at night? Jet lag, mainly. Um, <laughs> thanks, uh, Katie. Uh, I thought we said no tricky questions. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a conversation we actually had at the industry day today because, you know, if I'm brutally honest, the, I kind of started thinking about this. We did a, a trip out to uh, Space Systems Command recently, um, which is essentially the, the procurement arm of, uh, of US Space Force. 10,000 personnel there, and I forget the numbers right, it, you know, it's more or less, but only about 5,000 military. Only two and a half thousand only, two and a half thousand uh, civil service, but then two and a half thousand contractors. And, you know, in our, in our original plan, we did not, do not currently have contractors. We do right now because we've had to use them to fill the gap. So I have started thinking about that as a hybrid model um, into the future. And certainly when you speak to some of our US colleagues, the perennial problem is we're in for a couple of years, move the furniture around and then get posted somewhere else. When you've got contractors in there and you're paying them long term, actually you've got the continuity on the various programs and you're not just, you know, for the industry in the room, you're now not dealing with a different face every couple of years as, uh, as has been the case. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that I, I have taken over the last few months is the use of contractors and, and how we do that, how we budget for it in the first place. Um, in terms of our own workforce, uh, we don't, we, again, there was a discussion here today, there are certain areas where we need space specializations. So if you take our space operations center, for example, actually we're using space agency personnel who are the orbital analysts uh, on that side of things. We're training up our own personnel on that side of things. The intelligence side of things is specifics in space intelligence and understanding that particular environment. Um, that space traffic control, the conjunction analysis, that side of thing needs an understanding of orbitology um, in, in order to do that. And actually then when you get to the capability side, there are certain areas where we'll need people who understand it so that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe in procurement terms with, with SATCOM specialists or ISR specialists or whoever it happens to be. But actually the majority of the people, I think, uh, you know, are like me, and not necessarily a space specialist, but we need someone who's a procurement specialist and understands organisations and commercial, legal, financial frameworks, the legal aspects of all of these sorts of things. Uh, from the operational side, you know, the head of uh, ops plans and training we've got, uh, Air Commodore Mark Fluin, was not a space guy previously, but is essentially a command and control expert. Um, so when you throw him at a problem, you get the structures right rather than getting into the nitty gritty detail of the, uh, uh, of the space aspects. So all of that I think comes together. And, and I, I said right from the beginning, if the, the wiring diagram that Harv and the team had passed across to us as to, right, that's what you're gonna build. If that's what we end up building, then that was a lucky guess, mm -hmm. you know, three years prior, a really lucky guess. So I'm constantly on at the team to look at, you know, what do we need to change? Who do we move around? And what, uh, and what difference, you know, what different aspects do we need to bring in the future? And I think, you know, probably the biggest one is contractors at the moment. I still don't know, by the way, for anyone who is a contractor out there and uh, is, uh, is now looking to give me the business card afterwards. I don't know how we're going to do that quite yet, but certainly we're going to continue with the, uh, with the help that we've got uh, at the moment. But that's, that's probably the biggest thing. 
there's a much longer conversation to be had about space skills and where we're going with the training aspect, and that's one of the highlights of our um, IOC, is that we've just had a training needs analysis output, more well, we get it in two days' time, and we'll have a training campaign plan. So from a pure defence perspective, we do start getting people interested in space from a very early stage, whether you're, you know, whichever service you happen to be in, going through the basic training, um, and then the sort of postgraduate courses that require people to, uh, to have as they go through. And certainly, um, you know, we've got Cliff in the audience here who's, uh, who's off to study space at sort of PhD level out in the, uh, out in the US. And, uh, and you know, we'll take advantage of him when he eventually finishes and comes back as, uh, you know, as soon as he can. So I think long answer to it's going to change. You know, and uh, it's only by living this that I think I've worked out where we need to go in the future. I think there's a, uh, we, so we don't have problems getting people in the service, not, not in, certainly into the light blue. Um, we, we don't, we can recruit people, people want to join the Air Force, there's, you know, the kids see it as something that they aspire to. Um, and I think the space element of that will only help reinforce that position. We're already seeing that play out, and um, you know I, I work very closely with the charity called the John Egging Trust, which reaches out to young teenagers, some of whom are a little bit wayward, um, and you just see them get fired up about space. They love it. They don't necessarily understand all the stuff that we would talk about here, but it's space, so it's cool, and that's what I want to do. Um, you know, that's that. So I don't think that there's, but there's something around how we. Uh, overtly and maybe brazenly embrace that and do the inspire bit. And I think there's huge opportunity for us and even just this next year. We're going to do UK is going to do its first sovereign space launches this year and into next year, you know, we're going to be firing rockets out of Shetland. You know, if you said to any youngster, do you want to go to Shetland, they'd probably go, well, what? This time next year they'll know where that place is. Um, and they'll want to go there. And you know, we're doing work to build a space camp there because we know they'll want to go there. So um, I think there's something around the Inspire. The hard bit is retaining them. And uh, this is where you know, Goddard and the team are doing some brilliant work around uh, this idea of a zigzag career. You know, come in, we'll give you the training, you get to wear a uniform, you get to do all that cool space stuff in the military, and then maybe uh, you, know, you maybe step out for a while and then maybe you're a reservist um, and you still contribute and then maybe you come back in full time. And this idea of how do we exploit that, I think there's, there's, a, there's goodness in that somewhere. We just don't quite have it yet, but I think we will get there with it. And we see the US Space Force are already doing this. If, uh, if anyone is at all interested in this, go on Google and type in US Space Force Space is Hard. Have a look at the 30 second clip that General Raymond did and then tell me you don't want to join the US Space Force because <laughs> it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant and it's because of the subject matter. So there's something around that. On the, the, uh, Can I just jump in? So uh, the other thing you know, I didn't expand upon, um, we've had a discussion with reservists over the last sort of three or four days actually because we've um, We've not quite used them properly so far, especially reservists that come from industry where we're worried about putting into our capability and acquisition areas where you then wonder how much is going to leak out onto the other side, you know, uh, those sorts of things, whether there's any legal challenge to that sort of stuff. I think we're just going to go put NDAs in place, non-disclosure agreements, that sort of thing, and start using people that have got 20, 30 years of experience um, in and around space as well with a couple of the reservists that we have got. Um, in order to do it, and certainly um, we, it, we do need reservists, so clearly anyone in this room that, you know... Sounds like you're a volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah, who wants to put on a uniform and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe give up a couple of weekends, we could do with you, especially if you've got that, uh, that space experience to work in the Space Operations Centre and so on. Sorry. Oh, no, fine. I forgot um, the other question already. What keeps uh, us so awake? Keeps yeah. us awake at night. <laughs> well, so from my perspective, um, I mean, you know, if you, we could banter about it, but if there was one thing I, I would want us to just accelerate in terms of building resilience, it would be around provision of PNT. Um, just because we've done so much work around PNT and we really understand in quite high fidelity what the, what the impact could be to the nation if that was denied to us, 
even if it was just for a week, it would be billions of economic impact. And actually, I think you know, there's been some people have compared it economically to equivalent economic impact to when, at height of COVID pandemic, etc. I actually think it would be how how it would upset the fabric of modern life in the UK. You know, people who just pull their phone out and can get places, or can call places, or can FaceTime, and all those things that you do just in your phone to the normal punter on the street wouldn't work. You know, telemedicine, um, financial district, traffic lights turning green at the right time, all that stuff that would be okay, probably wear it for a day or two, but two weeks in, not having that, having had modern life completely underpinned by it, there would be looting on the streets. And, and that's probably not an exaggeration. So there would be this unraveling of modern society, I think, which uh, I'm not quite sure how we would deal with that. It's going to keep me awake at night now. Right. <laughs> so there you go. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, and it comes into the classification side of things as well, but the threat that's out there, and you would expect me to say that from a Space Command perspective, um, how we counter that threat. Uh, you know, we talk about it being an operational domain. It's up there already, yet, you know, we've got six geostationary satellites that um, you know, don't have everything on it that we would want them to in the future. So um, you know, how we get space domain awareness onto uh, Skynet 6A as an example, that a hot topic that I've said about 15 times a day for a reason. Um, how we get defensive packages, you know, whether that's electronic warfare or however you want to skin that particular cat onto uh, everything that we're going to put into, not just put into space, we talked today as well, but the ground and link segments as well. Are they cyber hardened? Are they physically protected? It's those things that keep me awake at night because especially with some of the things we've seen in the last few weeks as well, um, it's not a given that you're going to have access to, uh, to your assets. Um, and when you haven't got a lot of assets, you know, that's a big deal. So looking into resilience, Exactly why we're talking to a lot of, uh, of um, you know, other nations around the world uh, in terms of what they're doing proliferated Leo to, short, to ensure that someone cuts the internet cables down here, then we've got data pathways up there at uh, high speed through optical data links, and they are compatible at that particular point. So um, I think it's that side of things that, uh, that keeps me awake at night, as well as the PNT side of things now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you both. Thank you for asking or answering everybody's questions. And apologies, there's no room for any more online questions for today. But I'm going to invite John up to give some closing remarks and then invite us to the reception. OK, Julia, thanks very much indeed. Um, well, thanks very much. Um, I think we've learned a lot this evening. Um, Harv is watching too many editions of The Purge uh, at the moment. Um, God has doesn't have enough hours in the day, but fortunately has got such bad jet lag that he's making up for it at night. So that, that's good to know. 36 hours um, a day at the moment. And I'm pretty sure Harv did suggest that a big policy focus is on how to populate Mars. So in terms of vision, um, we, we've heard quite a lot, as well as delivery um, and um, not walking too fast before you can stand, um, which, which is, is not a bad thing to, uh, to take away from this. Uh, I think from the perspective of, 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 the, of a university, outside just the technical um, side, I said just, um, um, because that's not um, an area that we do, uh, particularly here at King's, from, from the, the Freeman Center perspective, and I think David would agree with me. Um, we, you know, we are interested in air and space power matters, and, and we see our mission as trying to um, create a generation who are more who are more space and air literate. Um, and and if we can support that um, by increasing diversity, which you both know I, I've spoken about before, uh, in the people who are coming through, which we think has to be focused on. Um, well, probably school leavers, undergraduates, and master's students, rather than only our, our brilliant researchers. Um, we'd like to have that conversation um, with you about it and with partner academic institutions, because I think it's very important. 
And as Harv said, you do need to excite the, the, the young generation. Um, and I suppose, notwithstanding the fact we haven't got the scale of the Americans, perhaps we can identify some things that will uh, generate that interest in space um, beyond the sort of the technical and the commercial interests who, of course, are very interested in space. So thanks very much. Um, I guess the only other thing I was going to raise with you to think about, and it's not about your personal careers, but in your staffs as well, how far space might require um, longer times of appointment, perhaps. Um, um, I take the point about contractors, um, and you know we are pretty major contractors at, uh, at Trivenham, and, and it's, it's a bit scary being the institutional memory, but I think we would all, on the civil side, like to have a bit more time with people who've certainly understood the sector um, to, to work with us, and if, 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 if that would be relevant to space, that's another conversation we could have um, with whoever comes uh, um, afterwards. Uh, yeah, and watch out for your budgets, I would say, my last point. I I'm pretty sure there's an armoured fighting vehicle um, tender out there coming up soon, which might want some money. Um, and, and then you might find some of the other uniform services uh, bidding for it. But overall, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's it's fantastic to hear from you, and it's amazing that um, you haven't repeated yourselves in three visits, so that's really good. Um, and and, and uh, I, I wouldn't say that is a consistent thing with all the speakers um, that, that we've invited uh, to King's, not Fassie, of course. Uh, so um, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'd also like to thank Airbus for partnering with us this evening and making this, uh, this event possible. And... We're, we're, we're delighted to have a bit of time to um, continue the conversation here uh, upstairs. And Julia, thank you very much for uh, leading Thanks. the conversations um, and um, posing some challenging but not too difficult questions as the two have demonstrated in dealing with them. Um, and Paul Anonymous online with their brilliant uh, questions. Um, as we said, put your names and then we'll, ask, we'll take your questions. So thank you very much indeed. And thanks everybody for coming this evening. Thanks.